Welcome, but welcome back, boys and girls. Lunda Kira and I'll bring you this one. WrestleMania 5, the Mega Powers Explode. This one took place on April 2nd, 1989. Return to the Trump Plaza in Atlantic City, New Jersey, for the second year in a row. Drawn a pay per view by it about 767,000 buys, which is a record that lasted for about a decade. Absolutely phenomenal number. The WF popularity was probably at its 80s peak at the time. I would say it went into a slow decline starting from 1990 onwards. But yeah, the wrestling business was just on fire in 1989. Because this was around the same time the Flay and Steamboat were having their rivalry. Actually, I think maybe the Clash of the Champions with Flay and Steamboat Classic was on the same day. I could be wrong about that, but I don't think I am. So yeah, this is also the only time in WrestleMania history that the WrestleManias went at two, the, the same arena in two different years in a row. This of course headlined by the mega main event, the mega powers exploding for the WWF Championship, Macho Man Randy Savage defends against Hulk Hogan, the year in the Nakin, which we'll get to. And this started the unfortunate trend of um, cramming so many matches into a pre-hour pay-per-view at WrestleMania. I mean, I know why they did it. There's 14 matches on this card, by the way. I know why they did it. It's because they had a large roster at the time, and they were, and they wanted to get as many guys as possible on uh, many guys as possible onto the show to give them a nice WrestleMania payoff, which was fine. But to me, it always affected the show in a negative way, in my opinion. I mean, I'd rather see eight or nine matches that all got all got decent time. Rather than 14 matches just crammed into one show. I mean, they do it for the next couple of years as well. And I'll probably harp on a bit about that later on, but yeah, just, I didn't like it anyway. But I understood why they did it. Now, we kick off the show for a one-on-one match. Hercules versus King Haku, managed by Bobby Heenan. Now, Haku, there's a character for you. Haku. Universally known as the hardest man ever in the wrestling business. In, in shoot interviews, when certain guys ask who the toughest guy in wrestling is, without hesitation, they say Haku, Meng, he was known in WCW. Some people even call him Tonga, but yeah. M virtually everyone's in agreement that Haku is the toughest man ever in wrestling. I mean, some of the Haku stories are legendary. Uh, including what not limited to gouging someone's eye out in a bar fight. Um, uh, cop, four cops trying to tear him then and breaking handcuffs. Now I'm, some of, I'm sure some of these stories are exaggerated, but still. Oh, I think my personal favourite is when um, hearing about where Bruce Beefcake was uh, complaining about him being too stiff. So Haku just grabs him by the throat, picks him up, pins him up against the wall, and then Hulk Hogan comes in the dressing room and asks, asks Haku to put him down. And because Haku respected Hogan, he did it, so yeah. So yeah, and then Haku is now King Haku by this point, taking the role from Harley Race. I mean, the King wasn't, wasn't an outright title, but you could, win and, you could win and lose it because Haku lost it to Jim Duggan late that year, who would then lose it to Randy Savage. Harley Race went down for injury after WrestleMania 4, so then Haku just took the King gimmick. And this was an okay opener. Uh, just, it was fine. Not not awesome or, or even good or anything like that, but, but decent enough. Um, Haku defeat, is defeated by Hercules. To get, so Hercules beats Haku and they open the match. Now next up, the debut of Mr. WrestleMania himself, Shawn Michaels. Teaming with Marty Jannetty and the Rockers, the face of tag team with the Twin Towers, the big boss man and Akeem. And this is a really good match, actually. One of the better undercard matches of the night. Just a very entertaining big band little man match. I mean, I thought the Rockers were awesome, to be honest. He came in the WWF in 88. And yeah, I just definitely one of the best teams around in that era. Got over quite quickly by just being awesome. And never really got a big push when they came in. Lost a lot of matches, but they got they got over because teenage girls found them good looking. And the work rate was just fantastic, so I think the men respected the work. 
They were pretty much the two best versions of the Rock and Roll Express, but dare I say it, the Rockers were better than the Rock and Roll Express. That's just my opinion. And obviously, the Twin Towers got a big push in 88 feud with Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, but now they're just they've settled in at the mid card quite nicely. And I thought these were a good team as well. Bossman was a young guy at the time, so he was pretty much learning from the veteran Akeem. Akeem also one man gun. And yeah, I just thought really good match here, very fast paced, entertaining. A great double, double drop kick from the top rope by the Rockers. And there was an awesome spot where Bossman clotheslined one of them and he did like a spin. And then obviously the, the Monstrous Twin Towers beat the underdog Rockers in. Yeah, good match here. Give it a thumbs up. Uh, third match in I am Brutus Bar Beefcake versus Ted DiBiase. Ted DiBiase has slipped down the radar since '88. He was now settled in an upper mid card role. Third, but third match in WrestleMania after he made a bent at WrestleMania four, and after he didn't win the championship, DiBiase because he's a million dollar man and he can do this. He um he bought his own tie. He bought the million dollar tile and carried that around instead. It was known as an unsanctioned belt by the WWF. So DBS would just call himself the Intercontinental, not the Intercontinental Champion, fucking hell, the Million Dollar Champion. And this was a decent match, not a great match. Actually, the longest undercard match of the night went just over 10 minutes. So that was decent enough. Beefcake wasn't the best worker in the world, but put him in there with a very good wrestler and you could get a decent match out of him. And DBRC was probably in the top five wrestlers in the WWF at the time as well, so yeah. Decent enough match. Not great or anything. I can't really remember if this had a storyline or not, or if it was just thrown together. I, d I, could, I don't know. Anyone want to fill me in on that? And obviously, this match went a double count out, which back then, you got quite a lot of fuck finishes on pay per views. Especially even at WrestleMania as well, but they were kind of accepted by then. They're not like, if they try to pull the stunt now, they'll probably just get booed out of the building. But sometimes having fuck finishes sort of worked back then. So yeah, DBRC and BK went double count now. Now the Bushwhackers defeat the Fabulous Rouge, your brothers. Yes, and this was an awful match to me. The Bushwhackers sucked, but I bet a lot of people didn't realise they had a whole other career before coming the Bushwhackers is the Sheep Herders and they had another name as well but I can't remember what it was the Kiwis that's one and, and Stampede Wrestling well yeah they've been around for like at least a decade as the Sheep Herders as this badass brawling team they were pretty much the 70s 80s version of the Dudleys and Dave Meltzer actually rated one of their matches in the Crockett Cup five stars. I haven't seen that match myself, but Cotton and Crockett, they had a, f oh, was it? Might have been for Fantastics. I'm not sure now, but I think it was, yeah. But then they came in the WWF and then just reinvented themselves as a comedy characters, Luke and Butch. Now, granted, they were absolutely awful in the ring, but the Bush were out. Uh, I thought the Bushwhackers were a fun act. They were entertaining. Got, got the kids into them with doing the little stupid arm thing and all that shit. And then you got the fabulous Rougeos, Jacques and Raymond, with Jimmy Hart in their corner. I've said it once and I'll say it again. Fabulous Rougeos, in my opinion, the most underrated tag team of all time. Thought they were good in the ring, entertaining on the mic. And in any other era of tag team wrestling, they would have definitely been tag team champions. But there was a lot. There was a lot of teams around at the time, so they never quite got their opportunity. But unfortunately, this match is awful. I'm not going to lie, the match was absolute garbage. Just ugh. Bushwhackers beat the Rougeos. Then they would actually have another match at Royal Rumble 1990, which was actually not a bad match. But yeah. Now, one of them. One of the more forgotten gems on the undercard. This is a real WrestleMania gem in my opinion. Mr. Perfect versus the Blue Blazer. Blue Blazer, as you probably realise, is Owen Hart. Yeah, Owen had signed with the WWF in 1988 as a Blue Blazer. With the mask and everything on. 
problem was though, Owen was a crew, very much a cruiserweight, and then that that era was definitely the big man era. You had to be huge to get a push, and there was no room for a smaller, high flying guy like Owen Hart at that time. He'd actually leave the company shortly after this, and then make a name for himself in Mexico, Japan, and then came back in 1991 and stayed there for the rest of his life. Now, Mr. Perfect was getting a huge push at the time. He was undefeated. And Mr. Perfect was quickly developing into one of the best wrestlers in the company. Of course, like many others of this era, he'd had over a decade of experience. Well, not, maybe not a decade, but a lot of experience in various territories. Most notably the AWAs, where he was AWA champion for quite a long time. Wrestling classic matches with Nick Bockwinkle and people like that. And yeah, I think this is the one where he debuted his Olympic style sim single as well. Now, this match only went 5 minutes 38 seconds, but they packed a lot of action in that time. So, this is one of the real victims for getting dicked for time. I mean, if they had 8 to 10 minutes, I thought they could have had a really good gem of a match. But it was just went 5 minutes, so not much time at all. But yeah, these guys for me showed really great chemistry as well. I mean, they could have had as good a chemistry as Perfect and Brett if they'd been given the time. But of course, Perfect and Brett got a lot of time in their matches. This was just a sprint. Blue Blazer gets to show off his moves. And then Mr. Perfect gets a decisive victory. Because Mr. Perfect was getting pushed throughout 1989, so... And Owen was pretty much, well, the Blue Blazer Owen was pretty much jobber of the stars at the time. And like I said, didn't win many matches at all. He beat the odd jobber on television and that, but when he wrestled anyone significant, he always lost because Cruiserweights were pretty much enhancement talent at the time. So yeah, Mr. Perfect against the Blue Blazer. Now the first championship match at the time. An interesting one, a handicap match for the Duref Tag Team titles. Demolition of Champions versus the Challengers, Powers of Pain and Mr. Fuji. Now this one had a backstory. This one had been building for a while, specifically for him Survive Series onwards, but really, the seeds were planted as soon as Powers of Pain came into the WWF. I mean, like I said before, a lot of people called Demolition Road Warrior imposters. But just look at the Powers of Pain here. These guys are Road Warrior imposters. I mean, they had the same tights, same similar face paint, similar hairstyles. I mean, for a glance, if you were looking from a distance, you could be mistaken for thinking they were the Road Warriors because Warlord looked like Hawk and Barbarian looked like Animal. But yeah, as soon as they came in the WWF from the NWA, they were pretty much groomed for a big showdown of demolition. I mean, there was a whole Survivor Series thing with the big double turn, which I've talked about before. I really loved that double turn, where Mr. Fuji turned on Demolition and went with the powers of pain, which turned Demolition babyface, which was absolutely the right move because Demolitioners' heels were getting really big babyface pops. And for me, they were just too cool to boo. I mean, they looked awesome. They had rugged ring styles. They had... Awesome entrance music. Yes, I want to say that I love that demolition theme song. Thought it was absolutely awesome. But then after months of build, we get this match at WrestleMania 5. And Mr. Fuji's added to this match as, as a part of the powers of pain. Now Mr. Fuji was a wrestler back in the territory days, Vince Senior days. Specifically a tag team wrestler. He had quite a few runs as tag team champions. And was a very good wrestler in his day as well, so this was at least believable to have him have him wrestle in this match. I mean, he was pretty old by this point, probably mid to late fifties. I'm I've no idea how old he actually is, but that's just a guess. And this match was okay. I mean, it was never going to be a great wrestler match or anything like that, but for what it was, it was fine. No real. No real complaints. Obviously not a good match or anything like that, but it was a big it was a big showdown between two monster teams which that drew a lot of money back then. This match was what it was, it was okay. Demolition for the second year in a row get the victory. 
Defeating the Powers of Pain to retain the titles. The, the titles that Demolition originally won at WrestleMania 4. I mean, Demolition, like I said before, for me, the greatest tag team champions of all time. Oh, and then next up, Dino Bravo versus Ronnie Garvin. Another one of those matches that just gets thrown on the card for the hell of it. Ronnie Garvin had been NWA champion in 1987. Defeating Ric Flair, which, good God, Ronnie Garvin's an NWA champion. How bad does that sound? This match was pretty awful, to be honest. It's not very good at all. Went just over three minutes. Just pretty much fill it, uh, fill some time out. Dino Bravo defeats Ronnie Garvin. Not really a whole lot to say about this. Now this show had the return of Rowdy Roddy Piper. Doing Piper's pit with him. Um, Morty Downey Jr. And I didn't really like this segment, to be honest. This was Piper's first appearance as WrestleMania 3. Then shortly after this, Piper would be become a full-time wrestler again. Ugh, this segment was bad. It dragged on for nearly 15 minutes. We had oh, the most cliché, cheesy lines you could think of. Just probably one of the worst episodes of Piper's Pit, in my opinion. And the whole the whole thing was based around Morty Down Jr. continually blowing smoke in Roddy Piper's face. Piper got pissed off, so the big gag line was Piper sprayed a fire extinguisher onto Morty Down Jr. But yeah, this took up a lot of valuable pay per view time. It, it was, if he shortened it or just scrapped it entirely and give the time of the matches, that would have been a lot better. Now this is another really underrated. WrestleMania gem. The Brain Busters defeating Strike Force. Rick Martel and Tito Santana had been tag team champions. Martel went no I think it was Santana who went down for injury actually. And then Martel was a singles wrestler, then they got back together. But there was obvious tension between the two. Now Brain Busters Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard managed by Bobby Heenan. Were high profile signs from the NWA at the back end of 1988 and I thought they were awesome. I thought they had a great little run in the WWF actually. I mean especially in that era where it was the big steroid field of guys. Arn and Tully came in with the normal looking physiques and got over on with the work rate. I mean I thought they had a great run. They won the tag team titles in demolition in a very good match. Routinely had awesome matches with the Rockers on the house show circuit and Saturday night main event. I mean, I've seen quite a few of the Rockers Brain Buster tag matches on various DVDs over the last few years and got to say, some of the best tag matches you'll ever see in your life. If you want to study the art and psychology of putting together a great tag match, watch the Rockers vs. the Brain Busters. One of the best tag team chemistries of all time and I really wish they'd wrestled on this show, to be honest. I mean, the tag, the whole tag scene, I wish he'd jigged the card round so the Rockers could have faced the Brain Busters and the Half Foundation could have faced the Rougeau Brothers. I don't think Rockers and Brain Busters on this show would have been awesome. Now, this match was very good as well. Went a little under 10 minutes, so... Got some time, but not a lot of time. And yeah, for me, a very Southern NWA style tag match just just shortened a lot. And the whole thing was, um, was a Santana went uh, he accidentally knocked Martel off the apron with a forearm. And then Martel ended up walking out on Santana, leaving the two on one. The Brain Busters obviously overwhelmed Santana, beat him with a spike pile driver. And so Mar Rick Martel turns heel on Tito Santana, breaks a strike force. He cuts a god awful promo after the match where he said he was sick and tired at least 10 times. Not, needless to say, Martel was given a manager shortly after this. Then Martel and Santana feuded for most of 89. Probably should have wrestled at WrestleMania 6 to be honest, but it wasn't to be. Now we're on the bigger matches of the night Andre the Giant versus um, Jet Snake Robert, with the special referee being Big John Studd. This is another one which feud which had been building as far back as late 88. I mean, it all started with them. Um, Jet the Snake Roberts scared the shit out of Andre the Giant with a snake. They even um, said that Andre had a heart attack over it. We, that was in bad taste, to be honest. I really hate when wrestling 
companies have restless fake heart attacks. I think that's just wrong in so many ways. So yeah, Jake the Snake was continually chasing Andre the Giant around the snake, which was great. It got, got Jake really over and which is good stuff. But yeah, and then the feud continued in the Survivor Series, Jake's team versus Andre's team, where Andre just choked the living shit out of Jake, got himself disqualified. And then there was a big part of the first, the, the big Royal Rumble match, where Andre beat the shit out of Jake and eliminated him. Jake would then come back and um, with the snake cause Andre to shit himself, then eliminate himself. So this was probably the most high profile field Jake had in the WWF. And yeah, it was just, I mean, it was just an honour for him to work with a major star like Andre. Big John Studd was the guest referee. Him and Andre obviously had history going back to WrestleMania 1. Studd had came back in 89 and randomly won that year's Royal Rumble, which is like, what the fuck, really? But then he didn't do much else after that and then left. I imagine it had something to do with his health, but I've also heard urban legends over the years that. Andre drove him out of the WWF. Stud was scared that Andre was going to literally beat the shit out of him. But yeah, and also at this time, Andre was just... But this match was an awful match, though. It's just sad to say, this, this is a time that Andre was just really, really, really broken down by this point. I mean, from 1986 onwards, he would decline in health. I mean, even at WrestleMania 3, that epic match of Hogan, he was broken down then. Then 1988 he got worse, and by 1989, he just, at times you can see he could barely walk at times. Even walking to the ring was a struggle for him. And I've said this before, but from 1988 onwards, I think Andre should have just solely been a tag team wrestler. I think he would have been a lot better off in that role. But yeah, he was trying his heart out as well, bless him, but... He was just so broken down, he couldn't really do anything effectively anymore. This, this was an awful match though, but... Andre gets disqualified when he hits the referee, Big John Studd, and yeah. So Jake gets a WrestleMania victory over Andre. Look, that was what it was. Now we've got next up the Half Foundation against the Honky Tonk Man and Greg Valentine. They weren't Rhythm and Blues yet, they were... Just both managed by Jimmy Hart, so that's why they were teaming type of thing. Hart Foundation, Bret Hart, Jim Neidhart. This was this was their first WrestleMania match in two on in a two on two tag team. I mean, they'd be in two battle rods and then a six man. This was the first two on two tag team match, and this was a pretty decent match. Not a great match or anything. I mean, the Hart Foundation were now baby faces. They did the big storyline where Jimmy Hart sold the contract to the Root. To get the Rougeau brothers. And I just don't understand at this day why they didn't just do Half Foundation versus the Rougeau brothers at this show. They could have easily put Honky and Valentine, the Bushwhackers. And though, yes, that match would have sucked, but we would have got the Half Foundation versus the Rougeaus, which would have been a. This, that, that could have been a real WrestleMania gem if it happened, I mean, yeah. But this match is fine, just, just kind of there, though. No, no complaints about it or anything. Just, just not that a memorable match at all, really. Half Foundation you get the victory over Honky and Valentine. Now, next up for the Intercontinental Championship, the Ultimate Warrior versus Ravish and Rick Rude. Warrior and Rude for me was one of the best feuds of the 1980s. Warriors breakout feud for sure. I mean, Rick Rude. These are two guys you would never think would have such good chemistry, but they bloody did. I mean, Rude had this ability to get the best out of the Warrior. I think he was the first guy to really get anything out of the Warrior. This feud all started... Well, the Warrior's Intercontinental Champion by this point. This whole thing started in the big super post down at the Royal Rumble, which... That was a fairly lame segment, but... Then afterwards, Rude attacks Warrior with the pipe, chokes him out. Then he ends up challenging Warrior for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 5. And this is a, this is a good match. Probably the best match a Warrior ever had at that time. Nowhere near as good as a SummerSlam 89 match, but for a match that went less than 10 minutes, it was good. What, like I said before, probably Warrior's first really good match. Him and Rude had some great chemistry out there. And you know what was in a monumental shocker at the time? Rick Rude defeated the Ultimate Warrior to become Intercontinental Champion. Uh, I think the reason for that being is because Warrior was built as indestructible. 
big powerful person so yeah great victory for Rude did it the whole spot the whole suplex over the ropes where the manager grabs the foot the heel falls on the baby face the manager holds onto the foot so Rick Rude cheated to win the Intercontinental title which was a monumental upset at the time and yeah just in a real good chapter in the rivalry Warrior of course win the belt back at SummerSlam so yeah really good match here between Warrior and Rude now the Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Bad News Brown this match was awful probably the yeah I'd say the worst match of the night either this or the Bushwhackers match but yeah just just the sort of crap we always got on the older Wrestlemania cars ugh went to a double DQ as well just bad match all round uh, yeah don't really want to harp on about that one too much now one more match before the main event Red Rooster versus Bobby Heenan Red Rooster was Terry Taylor and he came in the door with this ridiculous Red Rooster gimmick he had like the red hair on the top and his music was he did, a he did a rooster strut, all that sort of shit. I mean, you got some really shit gimmicks over the years, but I think the Red Rooster takes a biscuit. Now, the storyline for this one is um, Bobby Hinnon used to manage the Red Rooster. Bobby Hinnon would say he's the greatest manager in the world. He can take any average guy and um, make, him a, make him a star based on his guidance alone. So he picked Terry Taylor, called him. I think I'll call him my little red rooster, which actually tell him that people that Taylor was an average guy was probably not the best way to push him. But yeah, they, for months he would have them um, Heenan berate and rooster during his matches and shit. And then, then it culminated with rooster snapping, beating down Bobby Heenan and then um, firing him. This match was set for WrestleMania five, and this match only went 31 seconds. Red Rooster pins his um, wimpy manager to extract full revenge on him. So I've got no complaints about that. Now on to the huge main event. This is what this show's all about. For the WWF Championship, Macho Man Randy Savage versus Hulk Hogan. In a match it was a whole year in the making. I mean, this is what made, the build up this was so special. I mean, nowadays views matches build for a month, two months, three, four months tops but that's really rare but this one built for an entire year you could even go up far back and say the moment the mega powers formed that planted the initial seed so if you want to go through um, go on that logic you're looking at like 17 months but this match has really set the moment, the moment Savage won the title and in the tournament at WrestleMania 4 in the same arena in Trump Plaza but yeah so the mega powers were together they were best friends oh yeah brother I mean if you want to see a insane promo check out the promo of the mega powers when the mega powers form in like November 87 or whenever it was got to be the most cocaine field promo I think I've ever seen in my life so yeah like I say when they first got together Hogan and Savage are best friends, best BFFs, best friends ever. It was all hunky dory, it was all going well. But then slowly by slowly, Savage started to get pissed off with Hogan. Started to get jealous because Elizabeth managed both men now and just little subtle things where if Hogan would hug Elizabeth or pick her up or something, Savage would angrily, angrily glare at Hogan. You could see the jealousy build inside Savage. I mean, if you watch all the pay-per-views from WrestleMania 4 onwards, you can see the storyline slowly developing. Starting with the real turning point with SummerSlam, then Survivor Series got really heated. I mean, Hogan hugged Elizabeth, and then Savage got really angry over this. You could see it. Then the Royal Rumble, Hogan eliminated Savage in Bad News Brown. Then you could see that's when shit was starting to really hit the fan. Savage got in Hogan's face. Elizabeth was able to play a peacemaker for a little bit. But it was obvious that blood was boiling inside Savage and the bubble was eventually going to burst and he was going to snap. Now this happened in February on Saturday Night Main Event. 
It was a tag match between Hogan and Savage against Twin Towers. Uh, Savage got thrown out the ring, accidentally smashing into Elizabeth. And that looked a fucking brutal spot, by the way, if you ever see that. Elizabeth took that one like a pro, to be fair. But then Hogan takes a knocked out Elizabeth back to the locker room. Um, oh, what happened? But then, then he went back to the ring to help Savage. Savage slaps Hogan and leaves the ring. Then Hogan, being Hogan, the egomaniac, wins the match by himself. Brilliant. He's buried a whole tag team on his own, but whatever. Then they get back a locker room again. Hogan's holding Elizabeth's hand. And Savage starts berating Hogan. Then hits him with the belt, beats the shit out of him. Then shits on. The Savage heel turn, which has been building for months and months and months, finally happens. I just thought this was a fucking brilliant storyline. Then Savage was showing doctored footage of... He was editing a lot of the shit together to make Hogan look in the worst possible light. Accusing him of lusting after Elizabeth all this time. See, he wasn't man enough to face Savage one-on-one. -on -one. He, he went after his woman instead. And what I love, Jesse Ventura just agreed with everything Savage said. Because he loved berating Hogan. So, yeah... Then, obviously, the match was on. The fans are really... You could tell because of the buy rate and how big this match was. And before the match started, Jesse Ventura said the words, this is what the word main event was truly meant for. And that was a great call by Jesse because he was so right. So then we get the match and great main event, in my opinion. It Just in my personal opinion, this was the greatest match of Hulk Hogan's entire career. I'm sure... Some people won't agree with that, but that's just my opinion. I thought this was definitely the best match Hogan ever had. Savage did an awesome job, but it wasn't, wasn't a really much of a carry job, because, I mean, Hogan definitely held up his end of the bargain and played his role very well. Great psychology, good storytelling, good action, got a lot of time. Savage bumped around a lot to make Hogan look, like, look great. But then Macho Man, he even busted Hogan's eye up as well, which you didn't get a lot of blood back then. But I think that was a hard way, hard way one. I mean, he did that by accident. Then for the finish, Savage hits a big elbow drop from the top rope. Hulk Hogan gets up, does his little Hulk and up routine. You know the one, the one he did in all of his matches. Then Hogan does his boot, does his leg drop. Beat Savage to become the two-time WWF champion. Uh, does a little pause and routine and all that. And that um, closes out WrestleMania. And in my opinion, this WrestleMania show gets a lot of criticism. But not all of us deserved. Granted, there's a lot of bad stuff on the show. But there's definitely plenty to like about the show as well. I mean, you got the Twin Towers Rockets match is really good. Perfect Blue Blazer match was very good. The Brain Buster Strike Force match was entertaining. Rude and Warrior was good. And then Hogan and Savage was a great main event. So, especially for the stands of the time, I thought this was a good WrestleMania. Not a great one, but definitely the second best WrestleMania at that point. And yeah, I, I quite like this show, to be honest. And now I'm out for now, and I'll be back for WrestleMania 6.